of you remember that on the 24th of October last year, uh, we declared um, uh, November as a material and history month. Uh, just because November is the culmination of where things eventually uh, got to the stage where our kingdom was destroyed. But history had begun earlier than that. So today we thought we would start with um, uh, the Shangani Pekli. And we have invited Dr. Dr. Blessed Nguenya to come and bless us with that talk. Um, Manala is the moderator of this um, uh, session. So he will introduce Dr. Nguenya. Um, but the rules are that we mute ourselves during the lecture. If we've got questions, let's put them on chat and then the moderator will pick them up. And then after the end of the lecture, then we can have a discussion. Uh, over to you, Manala. Um, Dr. Ngwenya, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Dube. Uh, Dr. Ngwenya, um, his, uh, his full name is Dr. Blessed Ngwenya. He's a lecturer at the Department of Communication Science at UNISA. He holds a, a <coughs> Uh, he, was a, he was a doctorate uh, from University of Oxford. He is also an author of a book, Media Power Hegemony in South Africa, The Myth of Independence. Jeng is seen to as a band to Bagam Tragazi, will it will not be complete for us to introduce Udok Tanguenya, Um Sebenzwake Pela. Tina Amande Vele, Sichaluti, Si Togoza, Abezim, La Papumaco. So La Pacuma, Apumacona, Togoza, a Wena Doc Tanguena, Wabaguena, Baga Sechele, Sechele Sabacuena, Motualese, Waha Mushudu, O Palela, Le Palanyana, Raria, Yaha Sechele, Ermo, Le Rumo, La Secha, Togoza Kulu, Doc Tanguena. And uh, over to you. We hope that uh, to learn from me. Yeah, the floor is yours, Dr. Nguyenya. Um, We are ready for the lecture. Oh, no, th th thank you so much. Uh, it's been, I I'm, I'm both honored and humbled to uh, uh, give this presentation. To me, it is not necessarily a presentation, but it's a, it's a dialogue, it's an, it's an engagement. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the people that have uh, taken their time to, 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 to listen or to participate and engage in this. Uh, what I've done... Yeah, we can hear you. In as much as uh, I actually prepared notes so that this thing can be more like disciplined and uh, so that I can uh, like not veer off the script, but uh, you know, thinking and practice they are on a continuum. You can't really separate those. So as I was thinking out aloud, uh, I thought maybe I am going to veer off from the notes, maybe start with something uh, different, and then I'll go to, uh, to my notes. Um, to begin with, what comes into my mind is the popular poem by, um, his name is Hilary Beliok, but the poem is no longer popular now. It has been it was popular in the 1900s to the 1980s. Um, but the, the most important quote from that poem is that we have the maxim and they have not. Whatever happens, we have the maxim and they have not. Whatever happens, we have the maxim and they have not. You may know that I've repeated the quote three times. The, mag the maxim refers to the maxim gun. This was the most potent gun that was invented during uh, the 1880s and uh, used in warfare until the 1920s. Um, with this gun, but it was invented in 1887, but first adopted officially by the British uh, in 1887. Uh, uh, so it was first, the first time the maxim gun Used, it was used in the Shangani Battle, 25th October, which is 127 years on the dot today against 
against the Matebende in the Changani battle. Um, but my emphasis on repeating the, uh, that court three times, I've seen if someone like say, in Guni culture, when someone's name is Temba, if an adult says Temba, Temba, Temba three times, that is done with emphasis. Or even maybe in Hebrew culture, which I contest is African culture, when biblically in the text, when God said Moses, 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 that is done emphatically. But what I'm trying to say is that the Maxim gun and emphasizing on that quote on the Maxim gun, I'm trying to say this civilization we are actually in was brought. I was saying this civilization civilization we are actually in and um it's 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 uh, in a respective in, in a in a respectful way to say it's a civilization actually it's a decadence so this civilization or this decadence we are actually in was wrought or was brought in by the gun it was brought in by violence so these guys when they say the imperialist when they say whatever happens we have the maximum gun it shows that their hope everything that the uh, their hope hinges on is violence and the only people that understood that this uh, issue of violence is the um, modus operandi of the imperialists were the pre-colonial people. So they realized that um, to get rid of these people, it is only to use violence, but not negotiation. So this particular decade, this particular civilization we are in, if it was wrought by violence, it can only be done away with violence. But that violence, it is not, it is not uh, the the kind of violence that they used. There's what we call liberatory violence. Whereby, for instance, if one uses an example, if someone, if a dog is cornered, even a tame dog is cornered, and then people want to kill it, people want to bludge on it to death, what's going to happen is that it will lash out, it will be vicious, and it will be what people call violence. So this is a form of liber liberatory violence. But uh, the fact that now, okay, this particular violence has been maintained through two particular ways. Particularly when I'm using the Shangani battle in perspective, I'm, I'm going to go into the causes, the cause and the consequences of the Shangani battle. But now I'm just giving, I like the title you gave to this uh, talk. It allows someone to, so that we can rethink thinking and, uh, and learn learning. And then we have, we have a new way of remembering our, our history. But NS, which is actually what gives me the latitude to actually uh, make this uh, engagement more like open-ended. So there are two particular ways that this particular form of violence has been maintained, particularly on the Matebele. Because the Matebele are actually a peculiar people, if I wanted to say. They are the only kingdom that at its birth was recorded until almost its demise, its formative years, until its demise. So its birth, its formative years, its, uh, 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 its evolution, transformation, and everything is actually recorded. There's no other, except perhaps maybe the Egyptian. Uh, okay, we know during the uh, Fatane or Fetane, which many people have wrongly said it was because of Shara. Shara was actually born into Fetane. Mashoban was born to infect and all these people they were born into infect. In fact, as many people like uh, many scholars like Sabelo Kajeni uh copying, they have said infect is not to blame on the black leaders, it is actually to blame on the white encroachment when the white people were coming into the interior from the coast. So it caused uh, some shifts, some people to so much movement in the interior, people moving uh, back. So sorry for, for hearing, but what I'm trying to say is that this thing was done to this violence has been maintained through two ways. One, it is the theodicy of text. And then two, it is discipline. By theodicy of text, a theodicy coming from word theo, almost something that is God given. The black body all over the world today, it is the only body that does not think outside what it has been given. So by theodicy, I mean, if they're going to say, these are the African borders, Black people will not want to think outside that. And if they say, oh, this is your pastor, mostly with black people, they will not, they will take that person as a god. They will literally worship. So that is the theodicy part. So even a text, when people are reading a book, 
They say, oh, because it is written, if people are reading newspaper, or oh, because it is in the newspaper, therefore it is truth. But it, that is not necessarily true because that is how colonialism has worked. That is why we find that, especially the Changani battle, the Changani battle is very, my argument uh, in the North, maybe as I'm going to visit, if there's gonna be time, is quite paradigmatic. By that, I mean, it is a symbol of something. The Shangani Pact is a symbol of blackness. It is a symbol of black power all over the world. There are four other paradigmatic uh, uh, wars done by black people. Of course, there could be quite a number, but the ones that made black people have a particular idea that coloniality, whiteness can be defeated, it is those four. And uh, the other three, it will be the Haitian revolution. The Haitian revolution, uh, that's where black people actually defeated the, uh, 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 without any assistance, defeated the, the French and the, and, 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 uh, uh, the Toso leading that, um, um, uh, um, excuse my French, leading that, that, uh, that war. And then also we have the battle of uh, Isan Juan. And then we also have, uh, what the Basutu call, is called the Basutu War. Uh, is called the uh, uh, Intoa Yasikrit. That was in 1865 to 1868. And then we have the battle of, Isha, uh, of Shangan. But it is not a battle, that is a war. You know, battle is, is a way of reducing it to, to skirmishes, but that was a war. And those four actually have, they have tried to be, like, okay, if I to give an example of Haiti, Haiti economically or otherwise, it has always been suppressed because because it is a symbol of something. If something is a symbol of something, a symbol of victory or a symbol of resistance. So that is why I find that not many people can tell you about the Battle of Shangan because they know nothing about it. The only thing you can have, it is white historiography. When you have people like Chris Ash who write about the Matebele, but he writes from a very racist, unapologetic uh, uh, position, um, depicting people like uh, the King Lopengula as a tyrant, savage, literally almost eating people. In, in some of when he was describing, when he described the war, he says the Matebele warriors actually had Martini rifles. What they did, they were shooting in the air, thinking um, the bullets would come down like arrows. But that is a lie. If anyone knows the Matebele, it's not, not, it was a close combat, short stepping spear. They did not have that experience of an arrow going up. So you can see the, the, the lies, the, the, the falsities and the, the factoids that accompany the white historiography. But I am saying this, um, comes by disciplining for people not to think outside the logic that has been given, not to think outside a, a coloniality. By disciplining, it is not only physical. Disciplining can also come through uh, the education system. You are told in a particular, I'm talking about disciplining. Disciplining cannot only be physical. It can also be epistemic, educational, or even economically. Like for instance, well, these are, are on a library. For instance, if someone says in a textbook, this and one, two, three, and four happen. So you're supposed to write an exam uh, and maybe which gives you access to university. If you write the opposite or a different interpretation, you are already, you are already wrong, you have, you, you have failed. So for you to get an A or a distinction, now you have, to be, you have to be disciplined. So you belong to a particular discipline. But if you think outside that discipline, you are wrong. Economically, it can even go maybe to issues of say, uh, 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 the banking system itself, but that would be basically a digression, but I'm trying to elaborate on how disciplining works. It can work over so many years, but discipline also can, if we talk about epistemic discipline, it is not only about what is written, but sometimes it is all about what is omitted, because what is omitted is actually the silencing of a particular voice or the silencing of an alternative uh, uh, thought so like, for instance, the battle of Shangani, if it is a battle of resistance, it is a battle of liberation, but if it, you eliminate that, it becomes a bit problematic. And also, there's this emphasis of the Matebele, any historiography focuses on uh, migration and warfare, yet that is only a small part of a nation. And even in this white historiography, when these battles or these wars take place, 
the emphasis is on the numbers, how many were killed, who won, how many lost. But that is not, it does not tell the truth, uh, the entire story, if, if one were to say. Um, okay, I digress because I wanted to talk, I was talking about Haiti, Isan Ghana, Senegal, and, uh, but linking all together back to the battle of, uh, of, uh, of Shangan. So if you look at Senegal, Senegal is, a, if you've been following the news lately, you know Julius Malema went to Senegal, that is in the free state, where those uh, was uh, fired a shot in court. Um, it is interesting how history has got a, it's a way of resurrecting itself, like this state of Shangan. Now that there's this engagement, this dialogue, there's going to come a time where it is really excavated and it comes to the fore. So like, for instance, Senegal, someone will be asking themselves, why is that place called Senegal? Is it about Senegal or any, I mean, Senegal, the country or something? But Senegal is named after uh, is Major Frederick Senegal. He was a board commander. So he fought in what is called the Basutu Wars, which I, I alluded to earlier on uh, in Twa uh, Yasikrit. Um, in the Basutu Wars, that was between 1865 and 1868. I think uh, those dates, uh, maybe they might ring a bell, 1865 to 1868. 1868, that's when King Zulia died, isn't it? And that war, it is as um, Senegal was killed in that war by the Basutu. And it was almost, it was a victorious war. But because of memory and how we remember and how we value symbols, uh, which is different, particularly in the way we do it. Maybe it's because we, as black people, they've been subjugated, so we cannot practice our being almost uh, in a liberatory way or, or uh, for, for lack of a better word. At that point, because of the people who were killed, the boys who were killed in that war, the Basutu war, uh, what they called in, in Twilight Secret. It's called Twilight Secret because they use cannons, like uh, that, that sound, coo -coo 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 -coo. Almost like this work of but this work of was a maxim time. So, but it refers to the nature of warfare. So, a treaty was made in 1868. So, that a treaty was made, it's called the, I've forgotten the name of the treaty. It was made whereby the, in compensation of the poor lives lost, the whole of the free state, the whole of the free state, Seneca, Bloemfontein, was given to South Africa taken away from Lesotho. So the border stretch in compensation of that, of course, it is something that cannot be uh, revisited today, but it is when those borders were given, I mean, that uh, 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 Lesotho uh, uh, gave in compensation to the to those lives too. But uh, it's one of those things that also need to be visited just when we're talking about the uh, the, the, the Shangani battle. So I, uh, my argument is that the Shangani battle or the Shangani war was paradigmatic. It is a symbol of something. It stands for something. It has to be excavated. Of course, I know the, the temptation is to talk about the battle itself. Uh, the battle or the war itself, it's actually, it has so many different interpretations. Like, for instance, we have people saying there were only four white people were killed and there are 500 uh, uh, people from Insugamini, Islati, um, uh, um, Induba regiments were, 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 were killed. But that is not the entire truth. It is only a part of the truth. Because if you look at people like Captain Campbell, Alistair, they were killed. Those are top people. We're not talking about the, the foot soldiers that were killed. Like, in fact, in some of the historiography, you find that they tell you that um, the, the commander of Insugamin Regiment, Manondo and Shabalala, actually committed suicide because of the impact of the Muslim gun is quite, quite, quite. But it is not true because um, Manoda Shabalala actually died after, um, even, af even after the, 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 the first of November war because he was actually poisoned by the Guelo, a, a native commissioner because of the way he had uh, displayed a, a bravery in that 25 October war. So you find some of these uh, factoids, some of these lies, but these are made to emphasize, as I said, as I opened this thing with the, whatever happens, we have the maxim gun, or we have the maxim and they have not. Violence as the means, violence as the end. So, and hope as being in violence. Um, but I am saying, 
um, maybe to go back to to go back to the north of which I will I'll start like in the middle of the north, not uh, at the beginning. Um, the notes I prepared. The, the, the first is the causes. What were the causes of the Shangani War? Um, the causes of the Shangani War, they need to be understood in one particular way. That a war, particularly the Shangani War, was not an event, nor an episode. An event or episode is something that happens from, say, 21 June to 27 June, uh, June. That is an episode, that is an event. But it cannot be seen as an event. It is actually something that is epochal. The Shangani War is still going on today. It cannot be historified. It cannot be put into, into the past. Of course, history itself is a bit, uh, it has got its own contestations and uh, its own um, problems because some people see history as a science whereby you just excavate something that is from the past or you interpret something that is from the past. So history is seen as something that is what is from the past. But some people see history as an art. By saying history is an art, it is about how we interpret the past. So history is today. There's nothing called is in the past, that is called to be in the past. But that actually chimes with the African position of saying, because there is no past. What you call past is actually what is ahead. Because in the African tradition, those who are ahead, because they've walked that path, so they are actually ahead. So that is where we are going ahead. But say in uh, in some cultures, the the forward is like where you are yet to, to, to go. But the, those who have died, um, uh, they are in the past. It is which is actually a, a contradiction in positionality. So So what you call history is actually part of today. So that is what I'm saying. History is, the Shangan Bekri was an even epoch. Even today, it endures the effect of it. Let's say, for instance, the issue of genocide. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm pushing it too far. Okay, let me veer off. Let me put it this way. The Shangani Bekri, right? It was the British South Africa Company coming through. It was the vassals of the uh, 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 of Kama, the Botswana, almost coming from the southern column. But of course, in the end, they did not reach that space. It was a uh, South Africa. It was a uh, Hen Henry Lodge in Cape Town had to give a go ahead that okay, Jameson should attack. But he was not in it alone. He had to uh, talk to the foreign minister in England. So all these people are giving this uh, assault or this war a go ahead. So here is a the people, they are being uh, surrounded by so many people to be annihilated, right? But this does not come from nowhere. It comes from their history. Look at this event again. The same event happened in the, in the Transvaal when the Greek war, when the Barolong, when the Batroqua, when the Burus moved, literally he had to force Muslim leaders to move out of the transfer. You see, all these people conspiring against the nation. But maybe to also emphasize the idea of the epoch, let's go to the genocide of the, of the 80s. Uh, South Africa conspired because of uh, the fear that Umkondo is going to be trained uh, or given, uh, hosted by Zebra, isn't it? 